read from God's Word. From the 19th chapter of Luke. We're reading verses 1 through 6. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you as always for the word, um, this revelation that is so precious to us because it is your word. It is the word of God, the very word of God, the inerrant, infallible word of God, brought to us, Father, through great sacrifice over the years. We just pray now that you will help us not only to appreciate it and not only to understand it, but to apply it, to make it ours. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks to the kids. I don't know. I think that was Melody's idea, I guess, right? When you found out what this was, it was great. Um, I, don't, I don't know if they even rehearsed that a lot, did they? Did they just kind of... Saying it upstairs. Okay, well, good. It's good. Excellent. Well, we're in uh, Luke chapter 19. If you're not already there, please uh, turn there with us. Uh, this section, I didn't read all the way through, but it ends with what is the theme of the book of Luke and really the theme of the whole Bible in verse 10, where we read that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. You know, if, if, God, if, if Jesus is really God in the flesh, if, if, if Jesus really is God come and taking on human form and living here for 33 years, I mean, you've got to begin to ask the question, why? What is that all about? And over the next few weeks, we will be looking at this through a series of messages on incarnation's purpose. Incarnation, God becoming man. Why would that happen? Why would that have to happen? What does it all mean? But it is basically summarized in that little verse, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. If you don't think you're lost, there's no reason for Jesus to come. The fact that he did come illustrates that we are lost. The statement actually presupposes that mankind's problems are not the imperfections of some random evolutionary process that has led us to the kinds of issues that we face today. Rather, it assumes that the perfection that we strive for and that we desire and crave was once within our grasp, but was lost through the fall of Adam and through our own daily contributions to human failure. When we fail, we veil the glory of our Creator. That may not be a big deal to you, but it's a big, big deal to him. And it violates the very purpose for which we are created, according to Isaiah 43, verses 6 and 7. We are created to bring him glory rather than veil his glory. So we do that when we fail, and we therefore require saving to return us to the purpose for which we were made in the first place. This is what the incarnation was all about. Enter the Lord. As Jonah reminded us in Jonah 2.9 when he says salvation belongs to the Lord. This was the great epiphany of Jonah as he found himself entombed in this helpless situation, the belly of a great fish. Salvation is of the Lord. It certainly wasn't of him. And it certainly is not of us. Salvation is of the Lord. And this passage, this passage of Scripture tells us how, shows us how salvation, the salvation that the Son of God came to provide, is brought to one of the many men that God came to seek and to save who were lost. How did salvation come to Zacchaeus? Because look at verse 9. 
We read today, Jesus says, salvation has come to this house, the house of Zacchaeus. Can you think of any, I think, kind of sweeter words in the Bible than those? Today, salvation has come to this house. Don't you want salvation to be at your house? Well, you haven't understood the need if you don't understand that you need salvation in your house as well. Today's salvation has come to this house. What's it take for that to happen? I love how one lady said it. She got it. She was interviewing for church membership, which, by the way, we have a quick meeting after church today to interview with some prospective members, Trevor. I didn't get a chance to tell you that while I was rushing home and back. Um, where was I? The lady was being interviewed. And they asked her, you know, about her faith, about her testimony. She said, well, my testimony is very short and sweet about how I came to faith in Christ. She said, I did my part and, and God did his. The pastor was a little concerned about it. She did her part. She said, he said, what do you mean by that? She said, well, I sinned and God saved me. That's it. Beloved, that is the message of the gospel. I sinned. And God saved me at great price. It's all grace. That's what this passage is going to show us from beginning to end. It's all grace. We choose God only to turn around and find out he chose us first. It's all grace. And so we come to this account of Zacchaeus and how salvation came to his house. You know, the disciples, when Jesus said, I don't know how the rich are ever going to be enter the kingdom of God, it's so hard for them. And they said, well, then who can be saved but the rich can't be? And God said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And he shows it by saving this poor blind beggar that we saw last week and now this week. Saving this rich but evil man, Zacchaeus. There's no one that's outside the range of God's ability to save. There's no limit to what Jesus can do. And Luke even shows us how. You remember back in chapter 18, verse 17, Jesus had said, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. You have to come as a child. I don't think anybody in the Bible represents childlike faith like Zacchaeus does. If anybody ever enters a child, it was him. And so this great passage of Scripture teaches us incarnation's purpose, why Jesus came in the first place. We have, it's all here, the sinner, the, the Savior, and the salvation. Today we're going to look at the sinner because we want to see how this childlike faith played out in his life. And then next week we'll look at the other two. But today the sinner, Zacchaeus, what were the, what were the things that represented childlike faith in his life? Number one, Zacchaeus was sinful. I know a lot of you may be saying, well, wait a minute, we just did this last week with the beggar. Right. Because recognizing that simple fact is the starting point for salvation. There's no salvation if people don't realize that they need it. This is why, this is why those who preach only the love of God, only the love of God are so devastatingly cruel. Does God love his creation, beloved? 1 John 4, God is love. It's the very nature of God. If you, once you understand a little bit about the Trinity, the little bit we can understand, you understand this love that God is was going on long before time began and will go on long after. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It's true. Romans 5.8 in this is the love of God demonstrated that, he, that while we were still sinners, God died for us. You can't be loved any more than God loves you. There's no one in your life who loves you like God loves you. God loves all of us more than anyone ever possibly, anyone else ever could. But here's the issue, beloved. Love cannot save you. Love alone cannot save you. Well, your buddy... You know, jumps out of the airplane and he's got his, his, his parachute ready to go and he pulls the cord and nothing happens. Guess what? The fact that you love him isn't going to save him. And neither does the fact that God love us save us. 
If he doesn't take action and if we don't respond to that action, there is no salvation. Why? Well, Galatians tells us, among many other verses, Galatians 3.10, it says, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Why are we cursed? Because we fall short of the character of God. Because we do not and we cannot measure up on our best day. Wrongdoing that's part of our life puts us under a death sentence. You say, so, does he, so you mean to tell me that God can love us, can love someone and can condemn them at the same time? Absolutely. Now you're getting the picture, right? Because both are part of his nature as God. So yes, you must understand that. If you don't understand that, you will never seek salvation to, in, to insist or to believe or to imagine that we have a free pass because God loves us unconditionally. Doesn't make it so. And it distorts everything that the Bible basically says from beginning to end. The sin problem. Stage one of childlike faith is the recognition that I'm a sinner. Zacchaeus knew that he was a sinner. Actually, everybody knew Zacchaeus was a sinner. Zacchaeus, as we are told in this passage, was a tax collector. Actually, he's identified here as a chief tax collector. That, what that means is that he was the godfather of one of the three tax districts that, that, that existed in Palestine at that time, the one that was residing in Jericho. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was the one that bought the franchise and then sold it out to other people who collected money for him. And everybody knew that tax collectors cheated. Everybody knew that tax collectors had sold out to Rome. Everybody knew. The tax collectors were at the low, low end of the spectrum on the social and moral scale of the time. Everybody knew that. Let me tell you, the people of Jericho, the people of Jericho would have been absolutely apoplectic at the thought that of all the people who lived in Jericho at that time, that Zacchaeus would be the name that millions of people would know 2,000 years later. They'd have, been, they'd have been ready to string somebody up. He wasn't just the tax collector. He was the chief tax collector, and therefore in their minds and in his own mind, he was the chief sinner. Zacchaeus knew he was a sinner. Look at verse 7. The people complained that Jesus had gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. The people knew it. Jesus knew it. Zacchaeus knew it. He was looking for Jesus because he was guilty. He was looking for relief. Boy, did he come to the right place, right? The question is, if we made that childlike confession that, yes, I am a sinner, so difficult to do, not only by nature, but by act. Best day, still sinning. Best resolutions, still break them. Best intentions, still violate them. We are sinners. We call it anything but sin. We live lies of denial, you know. We just, we don't want to hear that. Most preachers have eliminated the word sin from their vocabulary. Why? For fear that they're going to offend someone. Consider that a loving thing to do. But beloved, let me ask you if, you, if you went to the doctor and he runs his battery of tests and he concludes that you've got cancer and he knows that there is a cure for this particular kind of cancer, but he chooses not to tell you because he knows that you're going to go through, you're going to be offended. You're going to be hurt. It's going to be a painful process, and so he withholds the information from you. Would you call that the ultimate goodness? Would you call that love on his part, or would you call that certifiable malpractice? It would be the most humane thing he could do, would it not? To withhold... What the Bible teaches about who we are as human beings, as sinners, is not the most loving act in the world. It's the most unloving act in the world. Even people who are outside of Christ. Now, not many, but there are a few. Carl Menninger is a psychiatrist. His 1973 book, Whatever Became of Sin, 
He says this, became a bestseller despite the title. He said, the very word sin, which has disappeared, was once a proud word, a strong word, an ominous and serious word. But the word went away. The word along with the notion. Why? Doesn't anybody sin anymore? Doesn't anyone believe in sin? He went on to note that the last time the word sin appeared in any kind of presidential proclamation was the National Day of Prayer in 1953 by President Eisenhower. And he said it was only there because Eisenhower was quoting Abraham Lincoln. I don't believe in sin. C.S. Lewis, the great apologist from Oxford and Cambridge in the middle of the 20th century, said this. He said, the, hurry, the, the barrier I have met is the almost total absence from the minds of my audience of any sense of sin. And if we need to update that, D.A. Carson, a theologian at Trinity Seminary who has written volumes and volumes, but he's a very active man speaking at conferences and, and particularly on college campuses. He says this about college students. He says they know how to sin well enough, but they have no idea what constitutes sin. It's true. We, beloved, in churches are culpable. Not telling someone that they are lost in sin is not doing them a favor. You may save them being offended. You may become their friend, but you can never be their helper to find their way to Christ. Till they know they have a problem, they cannot come. So we must first understand that we have a need. You know what? We're all sinners. It's just a question of whether we're saved or unsaved. It's the only, it's the only difference. So Zacchaeus was a sinner. Secondly, Zacchaeus was seeking. Zacchaeus was seeking. He was seeking casually at first, I think. Notice verse 3 of our passage. It says, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, literally. <clears throat> and he was seeking to see Jesus who he was. I think there's two levels of seeking that were there. First of all, you know, Zacchaeus undoubtedly was looking for, well, which, which, guy, which, which one of these people really is Jesus? They didn't have CNN in those days. So, you know, everybody didn't know everybody's face. I think it would have become obvious pretty soon who's following, who, who is everybody following. It would, be, it would have become pretty Obvious who is Jesus, but he didn't know that, and he's seeking to find out, well, who, which one of these guys is really Jesus? But I think his curiosity went deeper than that. I think he wanted, wanted to know what Jesus was all about. That's why he was there. He wasn't just there on a mission to see, oh, let me see who this guy is. Zacchaeus had already heard some things about Jesus. He knew about the preaching he knew about the reputation he had for speaking as one who has authority. He really knows what he's talking about. He knew the miracles that Jesus had been doing. He knew he was an amazing person. There was nobody who had ever been like this that anybody had ever known on this earth. And Zacchaeus knew that. He knew that Jesus loved people. That was evident from the things that he had done and the things that he said. He knew. He knew that Jesus had a tax collector in his inner circle, Matthew. You can't tell me that that didn't intrigue Zacchaeus. And he knew that the greatest enemies of Jesus were the Pharisees, just like they were the greatest enemies of Zacchaeus. He wanted to know more. You know, saving faith, saving faith often starts with a kind of a prickly curiosity. Often starts that way. And I just want to say, if you're here this morning, if that's you, keep seeking. Be like a child. Don't give up the curiosity. Seek it out like Zacchaeus did. He was going to find out who this person was. There's an old short story by a, by a Frenchman named Jean de la Rennes. And he, and he tells about people, a bunch of people going to this house for a dinner one night. They've been invited. In the process of being there, they find out if they stick their arms from the lighted dining room into this, into this darkened room that's on the other side of the drapes, 
if they do that, they can try and grab, and if they just happen to grab a spirit in there, the spirit will have to talk to them. I mean, it's a crazy story, but you get the idea. That was that's made a good story, I guess. Fishing for ghosts, I guess you could call it. But, but, but here's, here's the wonderful thing, beloved. God has given us something far greater than that. His Word. God has given us the Scripture, His self-revelation, which which completely reverses that process. We don't have to go about groping in the dark to try and find God, to try and grab a hold of Him. He's already spoken. He's already reached through the veil of heaven that separates the spirit world from the physical world. He's already done that with His Word, and He's revealed Himself so that we will know who He is. I urge you, As curiosity strikes, don't put it aside. Find him. But you have to find him in the place where he has given himself in his word. Read the Bible. Say, I don't understand it. Read it again. Read Mark. Read it twice. Read it five times. Read the Gospel of John. Keep reading. Get a study Bible. Get a commentary. Find out what God is revealing about himself. Let your curiosity take you where you find him. Isaiah 55, verse 6 says says this. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Like Zacchaeus. Jesus was near. Zacchaeus went looking. So can you. You don't have forever. It says, seek him while he may be found. You don't have forever, but you have now. Seek him. While he may be found, Zacchaeus was searching. Thirdly, Zacchaeus was single-minded. He was sinful. He was searching. And he became very single-minded in his pursuit of Christ. To understand this point, you really have to see there's a problem and there's a solution. So hang with me for just a moment because the problem is a little deeper than it looks. Okay? Okay? Problem is, of course, in verse 3. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Now, all my life, I thought that Zacchaeus' only problem was that he was short. Small in stature, right? Think Danny DeVito in Other People's Money or something, right? Or anything he ever did. That's how I viewed Zacchaeus. This little guy running around and trying to see Jesus. And that is part of the problem. It says, because he was small in stature. But see the word on account of. It's the same phraseology. It's another, it's another causative clause. There were two problems that Zacchaeus had. And it's not completely obvious in the way this is translated. It sounds like, it, the, okay, the crowd was big and he was small and that was the problem. That wasn't the problem. He was small, that's true. But the problem was the crowd was also a problem in addition to his stature. Why? Verse 7, because the crowd believed him to be a great sinner. The crowd was not about to invite Zacchaeus to come to the front. Do you see the problem? When they found an opportunity to make it difficult for this little guy that was the bane of their existence, they did it. The crowd was a problem. They hated this man. He was the one collecting their taxes and cheating on them. And so they would not let him through. They blocked him. Usually somebody who's taller will willingly let somebody who's shorter through, right? Because they can see over the top. Not Zacchaeus. Why? Because they hated him. The crowd was a problem. You ever think how often the crowd keeps people from Jesus? The crowd keeps people from Jesus. The crowd killed Jesus. The crowd, the crowd. You know what you can almost, you can, you can almost, you can almost put this in your pipe and smoke it. I hope you don't smoke a pipe, but you get the idea. And if you do, I don't, it's okay, I don't care. But, that, but, the, <laughs> but the, point, the point is, The point is, the crowd is almost always wrong. Do you know that? The crowd is almost always 
wrong. And the crowd keeps people from Jesus. The crowd is the salvation killer. Now, when we think about that, there's two kinds of crowd. Two kinds of crowd, at least. There's the unbelieving crowd. The unbelieving crowd are those who would say to you, you're thinking about what? You're, you're thinking about becoming a Christian? You, you, gotta be, you, you must be kidding me. Surely you know the Bible is riddled with errors. And this guy, Jesus, yeah, nice guy. I mean, you know, and yeah, he, he taught some fine things, great moral truths, but I mean, a virgin birth, God in the flesh, resurrection from the dead. I mean, who, who are you kidding? You, you're going to buy into that? You have to check your brain at the door to become a Christian. That's the unbelieving crowd. How many people have been intimidated out of salvation by that crowd? Maybe you're one. Perhaps these things bother you. Perhaps they've kept you from a true commitment to Christ. May I say to you just as lovingly as I can, keep investigating. Keep investigating. Keep looking. Here's what you'll find. Beloved, there are answers to every single objection that your philosophy 101 or biology 101 professor put in your mind. Answers to every single one of them. There are. You don't have to check your brain at the door to become a Christian. In fact, the Bible urges us to not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our what? Mind. Your heart will follow your mind, and you have to get your mind investigating what is here that's objective. There's no other religious faith that is so ingrained in human history as Christianity. You know, in the last 50 years, Christian philosophers and scientists have made absolutely gigantic strides, unbelievable strides in tearing down the empires of pagan rationalists. The problem is nobody's paying any attention. People just hear it in school and they believe it and they walk away intimidated out of any thought of becoming Christian. You owe it to yourself to investigate the answers that may be bothering you. Don't let the unbelieving crowd lead you down the same path they're going. The crowd. Then there's the believing crowd, right? Then there's the believing crowd, so-called Christian crowd, the church crowd, those who claim the name of Christ but are not living consistently with the principles of the Bible. Now listen, I say this knowing none of us live consistently, totally consistent lives. But beloved, to the extent that we are living lives of hypocrisy, claiming one thing and living another, we turn people away from Christ. We do. They have a right to look at us. And when they see us not loving our brothers or sisters, when they see us fighting, when they see us disobeying the commands of God, defending our own rights, you know, totally ignoring passages like Philippians 2 where the Lord says, what we've been memorizing, do, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Listen, some of us would rather die than actually do that, right? Our rights are more important to us than the commands of God. Some of us live lives that are one thing on Sunday and something else the rest of the week. Our language is one thing on Sunday, it's something else the rest of the week. Our thought life is one thing on Sunday morning and something else by Sunday afternoon and the rest of the week, right? We're a deadly crowd when that happens. Potential believers look at us and say, if Christianity produces people like that, it can't be true. If Christianity were true, it couldn't produce people like that. But it looks like Christianity does produce people like that, so it must not be true. And you know what? Jesus says they have a perfect right to look at us and come to that conclusion. Didn't he say that? 
He said in, in John 13, verses 34 and 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. What's the other side to that? If you don't have love for another, one another, they have the right to declare you irrelevant. The Christian crowd. Yeah, Zacchaeus was short, but his bigger problem was the crowd. So what's the solution? What did he do? He climbed a tree. If the crowd is keeping you from Christ, what do you got to do? You got to get high enough that you can see Jesus instead of the crowd, right? You got to be looking in the right place. You got to climb the tree. He ran ahead and climbed in a sycamore tree to see him for he was about to pass that way. We saw that sycamore tree when we went on our trip to the, didn't we? Diane will verify this for me and Sharon, wherever you are, we saw that tree and then they finally acknowledged it probably wasn't that tree, but it looked like the tree, right? It was one that was supposedly was that old in Jericho. The sycamore tree, he climbed it. Jesus said in Luke 18, 17, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. That's the verbal message. You know what the pictorial message, the visual he gives us to see what this looks like? It's Zacchaeus climbing the tree so that he doesn't be influenced by the crowd, but he's influenced by Jesus. It's Zacchaeus saying, I don't care what the crowd is doing. I don't care what the crowd thinks of me. I don't care what the crowd says. I only care what Jesus says. I'm going to get above the crowd. I'm going to overlook the crowd. The crowd is not going to be relevant to me. And he did it at great cost. Listen, it says he ran to get to this tree, right? Nobody ran older men in that culture. You just didn't show your legs like that because with those robes flying, everybody could see everything. But he didn't only just do that. He climbed up in this tree. Dignity and and his, you know, reputation, everything, he just threw it aside. Listen, if they had had, if they had, had YouTube in those days, it had gone viral. This rich, prominent man climbing this tree? Why? So we could see Jesus instead of the crowd. You've got to get above the crowd, beloved. You've got to quit worrying about what somebody else thinks childlike faith ignores the crowd. It doesn't mind being thought stupid if that's what it takes. It doesn't accept the, ch- the, the, the conclusions of the crowd. It's willing to overlook the hypocrisy of others that are in that Christian crowd, to see beyond them, to see the, the, to the God that they claim to worship, to find out how wonderful he is. That's the only thing that shows them how bad they are. Get to the place where you're seeing God, where you're looking at Jesus, where you're seeing him. You have to get to the place where you accept the fantastic faith that Jesus really did die and was buried and rose again for your sins. Not for anybody else's, for your sins. You have to get to that place. You have to come to that conclusion. You have to acknowledge that basically as the driving factor in your life. You have to accept God's mercy. You have to see it and then accept it. You have to get above the crowd. There will be... Beloved, I assure you, no dignified, self-important, self-sufficient, self-righteous people in heaven. That's the crowd. They will not be there. Salvation is for those who care more about what he thinks than what the crowd thinks. Little town had a volunteer fire department, right? The problem was they were quite efficient, but every time the whistle blew that, it, that, that basically indicated you got to come and get your stuff on and go out to the fire, they would do that, but then half the town would follow them. And of course, it became a problem because half the town would then be in the way of what they were trying to do. So they put notices in the paper, please don't follow the fire truck when the alarm sounds, please stay away. But you know people, right? You are one, right? They kept right on following. So one day the alarm sounded, the fire trucks came out, they drove down the street, they came to the end of a dead end street and they stopped, no fire in sight. The firemen got out of the truck, they came back to all the cars that had followed them and started selling tickets to the next whatever it was, right? Fundraiser. And of course all the people that had followed, what are you gonna say? No, I don't wanna buy a ticket. 
you know, you're watching me do my job. You need to buy a ticket. What's the point? The point is you follow the crowd and sooner or later you're going to pay. The crowd will only lead you to judgment, beloved. The crowd will only lead you in the wrong direction. I don't care whether it's the unbelieving crowd that says it's all a joke or the believing crowd that won't live up to what they claim to be their inheritance. You've got to get above both of those and begin to see God for who he is. Climb the tree. See Jesus by faith. Deuteronomy 4, verse 29. Moses reminded the people, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. Can you say that you've really done that? All your heart, all your soul. That's when you find him. Zacchaeus was seeking. He kept seeking until he was found. And it can happen to you. So Zacchaeus was sinful. Zacchaeus was searching. Zacchaeus was finally submissive. He was submissive. Look at it in verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Notice Zacchaeus just didn't pray a little prayer up there in the tree and then he was saved. Did you notice that? Zacchaeus was certainly saved the moment his heart opened to Christ. But what what, what follows that? What follows that is obedience. Jesus came and said, I got something I want you to do, Zacchaeus. I want you to hurry and come down because I want to stay at your house today. So he hurried and he came down and received him joyfully. The final element of childlike faith is submission to God. It's obedience to his word. It shows, it's not the thing that saves you, but it shows that the faith that you claim has been real. There's action. Listen, in a sense, Zacchaeus was turning his house over to Christ, right? That's the, that's the image that we're to get out of this. There was an abdication here. There was a new Lord of the throne. There was a new master of the home. There was action that followed faith that demonstrated the reality of the faith. He was submissive to the Lord that he had been so long looking for. If there's no obedience, there's no reality. If there's no abdication, there's no salvation. The throne of our heart, beloved, has to be emptied of self and it has to be filled with Jesus. That's the, that's, the, that's the point of this little verse. But when we come to faith in him, wow, the picture is so correct. You're so excited. This is now mine. I have the joy of knowing Jesus as my own Savior and Lord. He's now the master in my life. He's the one I want to obey. What a picture. I mean, here's Zacchaeus. He's a guy who started the day. He started the day as a guy who had sold his soul for money, right? He had sold out his nation. He had sold out his reputation. He'd sold out his faith. He would sold out everything that we might consider good for the sake of money. He was as far from the kingdom of God as you could possibly get. And by the end of the day... He is hosting the King of Kings in his home. And it can happen to you. It can happen to you. But we have to come in childlike faith like Zacchaeus did. We have to see these steps evident in our own life. What a day he had. Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open the door, I will come in to him and dine with him or her. That's devotion. That's fellowship. That's love for one another. That's engagement. That's relationship. That's what salvation is. That's why the Son of of God came from heaven to earth to provide that possibility for lost humanity. That's what it's all about. When Zacchaeus knocked on, or when Jesus knocked on Zacchaeus' door, he couldn't open fast enough. How about you? Have you let him in? Have you been found by the Savior? He came to seek and to save those who are lost. You know, uh, 
1989, there was this huge earthquake in Armenia. Some of you may remember one of those little countries over there in Asia. Something like 30,000 people were killed in less than four minutes because of this earthquake. One father who survived the earthquake went running to the school where his son was in school. And when he got there, of course, he found the school in, in rubble, found other parents standing around, crying, trying to comfort one another. He immediately went to the corner of the school where he knew his son's classroom was. And he began to dig through the rubble. And all the people who were there said, oh, listen, it's too late. It's too, you know, let, let, the, let the rest of the people do their job. The police and the other officials came and they told him, sir, please, you know, don't bother. You're just, gonna, you're just liable to hurt yourself here. We're going to dig through the rubble later, but you need to go home. He kept digging. For eight long hours he dug, piece by piece, just trying to find his way down. Eight hours. Then it was 12 hours. And then it was 24 hours. And then it was 36 hours. No going home, no sleep, no rest, no food, no drink, just digging. In the 38th hour, he heard a little voice as he pulled one last boulder away. And he hollered down and he said, Oman, Arman. And his son hollered up at him, Dad. He said, Dad, I'm down here. He said, I knew you'd come. You told me you would come. I knew you would come. This is what the incarnation is all about. It's about God coming to save us, not from a physical problem, but from the spiritual problem of sin that infects all of us that we're born into. It's about him taking the price on himself to make the payment. It's about him digging through the rubble to provide the salvation that we could not provide any, any, any other way. Jesus has come. Here's what the incarnation is about. The, the incarnation is simply this. Jesus came for you. Jesus came for you. Jesus came for you. Jesus came for me. That's what the incarnation is all about. Now the question is, will we accept him? Will we turn our life over to him? Will we give him the keys to the house? Invite him in like Zacchaeus did. I'll tell you what, when you do that, you will find that you've searched for him until he found you. Right? We choose him because he chose us first. If you haven't found that out, today would be a great day to find that out. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the word. Thank you for the illustration from the life of this man. How he got above the crowd, how he managed to not worry about what others might think of him, how he looked totally for you until he found out you came for him. I love how the wording is in some of this that we'll see next week. But Father, to think that there you are going through town and you're just passing through, but Zacchaeus shows up and bam, you stop, just like you did for that blind man last week. It's the same stop that happens every time you hear someone cry out for mercy. It doesn't stop you when we cry out, here's all my goodness, here's what I have to offer you. But the moment we acknowledge we have nothing to offer you except our sin, that stops you dead in your tracks. I am so thankful, Father, for that. I pray with all that's within me that there's no one here this morning who hasn't experienced that. If there's anyone who has, Lord, I pray that they will open their heart right now. Confess their sin, invite you in. Experience today what Zacchaeus experienced 2,000 years ago when you came to his house. And then, Lord, for those of us who know you, oh, I just, Lord, please burden us. Place in our hearts compassion for those who do not know you. If we don't have that, Lord, we, then we cannot claim that we have the heart of God beating in us. We, we just don't. So help us to care. Help us to love enough to put feet to our prayers. So bless us now as we sing this final song, Lord. I pray that it will be the prayer of our heart as we close this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.